So thank you again for having an opportunity for me to present this uh, presentation. Um, it is a presentation that uh, I've given before and a uh, number of times, and uh, usually I give it about once every one year or every two years, so um, to keep up to date uh, with the current group of the residents and fellows. Um, this is uh, actually a part that, uh, um, a part two of, um, uh, of the uh, two part series uh, that talks about ultrasound physics, uh, as well as um, the artifacts that goes with it. And um, this is an essential part of the um, um, American Society ECHO exam, if you are planning to take it. Um, the objective of this presentation is to review basic ultrasound physics that leads to echo artifacts. And, uh, hmm. sorry, I'm trying to remove this thing. It's kind of in the way, so I apologize. Hang on one second. Okay, so um, we want to uh, review the common echo artifacts that I encounter in the day-to-day -day clinical setting and also to challenge the participants, which are you, um, to um, some of these echo artifact cases. I'll, I'll pick on people that, um, uh, that I've not picked on before in the last few years, so especially the new colleagues. So um, I want to pay tribute to uh, one of my teacher, uh, Dr. Bob Levine, and for those people who don't know who he is, he is the one who um, um, actually wrote the chapters of Metro Bob and 3D Echo uh, in the original Wayman. He's also a staff at uh, Mass General uh, that uh, uh, many of us trained with, uh, many of the academic cardiologists uh, or echo cardiographer in the country, in Canada, are trained by him and Mike Picard and um, uh, Dr. Ned Wayman. And, and during his uh, our times when we were there, um, we were very much into um, echo artifacts and trying to explain some of these artifacts. And uh, according to him, the art of echo interpretation is the art of interpreting artifacts. And um, I'm very uh, pleased uh, to find that I think Bob is actually being honored this year at the uh, supposed to be in Boston uh, ASE meeting. So it'll be coming up in May. Okay, with an award. So um, this is one of the other uh, quotes uh, that is uh, true to echocardiography as well as true to clinical medicine. It says, Watson, you see, but you do not observe. So, um, so maybe I'll just uh, go into the audience and see um, how good your general knowledge is. Um, do you know who is, um, who actually wrote Sherlock Holmes? Anyone? Okay, let me see the list. So in is um, maybe um, I know it's job. Can we? Can, is staff allowed to uh, answer? Oh yes, or not? of course, Kim. <laughs> so Kim, what, Arthur Conan Doyle. That's right. Very good. Excellent. And who is he? And what does he do? Call a friend. I'm sorry, call a friend. So who is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? What, what was his real job? What was he trained in? I don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, NS? Uh, well, uh, uh, and I learned this from Dr. Chow, actually, uh, that he's a physician. I think he's a Scottish uh, physician. Yeah, he is actually a doctor. And uh, thanks for bringing this up. So. Um, just, just for interest sake, uh, so Alvin Conan Doyle is actually a, um, um, it's, it's a, it's a not so like you know not so brilliant physician, so so as to say, it's not like you know Osler or other people, but but he's actually very good at writing. So he he uses observation um, uh, that he got from his uh, uh, physician uh, supervisor, uh, who is uh, from Edinburgh, uh, to see how acute uh, they can observe things and put that particular mindset into Sherlock Holmes and. Put himself as uh, Dr. Watson, so that was his, you know, substitute figure in that. But you know, this is um, something that you know germane to what we do every day. We are we are detectives uh, in many ways, and uh, that we try to like detect things both in uh, imaging as well as our clinical medicine. So, in terms of uh, definition of artifacts, I'm so sorry, trying to present from one screen today. To move things around. So any structure in an image that does not correlate directly with true anatomy, there are errors in imaging that are perceived object that is not real. Um, sometimes the true anatomy is not displayed. Uh, structural location that is misregistered. So it's supposed to be over there, but it's here. 
I'm going to show some examples. There are sometimes structures that have improper brightness, improper shape, or improper size. There's also um, the causes of artifact can be a, a multitude of them, including acoustic articles, which violate the assumptions of the 2D echo mapping. There could be equipment malfunction or design. Um, way, way back when, when we started echo, like, especially among the staff, like equipment has to be uh, maintained every three months, every six months, every year. Um, they have to actually bring in a phantom to actually calibrate it. I'm actually curious, like, you know, over the last 10 years, we, we never have to calibrate with Hello, hello. There's also, like, you know, if you have challenges with the phantom, yeah, okay, cool. didn't calibrate it you correctly. Know, after that, or... yeah, please move yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It could right. be calibrated. Right. It could be faulty yeah. crystals. Well, it's it's I know it's so different. Yeah. 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 So, like, yes, I might have some faulty in the case. Yeah. Greater error. Awesome. Um, so, this is happening while uh, for me that. And uh, with proper gain and the way that we adjust. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. And also, yeah. the, the, can everyone the, mute? Uh, it's right. very hard to hear. Yeah. I'm sorry, please yeah. mute yourself. You cannot. Yeah. Okay, so we know that. Um, yeah. Hello, sir. Janice, can you mute, please? Is everything going? I have the order for the first one or the second one. It must be the first one. Everybody's yeah. in Facebook, right? Sorry, Chi-Ming. Oh, no worries. The second or third order in yeah. second? Oh, okay. Oh, this is the other. OK, this one from the other. This is not doing so well. OK. So um, the, the basic yeah, assumption is that you the actual yeah. 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 so them function like pointers. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so there, there are basic assumptions of 2D echo mapping, uh, including sounds travel in a straight line path from the transistor to the reflector and then back. And all the reflected echoes arise from structure that exists along this line of the transducer main axis. Oh, um, the, this is the one that we went over this with the fellow yesterday. Um, um, this is the number that you have to remember for your exam, that when you put it, put everything together, including uh, like tissues and, and bony structure and everything. So in human body, the sound travels at 1540 meter per second. So this is a number that you have to remember because this will come up in the exam in a multiple choice uh, for your, uh, for your uh, American Society ECHO exam or being a testimony of the National Board uh, echo exam. And the intensity of the reflection produced by a structure is directly proportional to the scattering strength of the reflector. So, for example, bubble, you know, has a strong acoustic um, boundary. That's why it's very bright when you reflect it. And when your soft tissue is less bright, and so on and so forth. And um, uh, same as like you know when you have a, a pericardium, for example, that's that's really bright because. Mm -hmm. Uh, scatter string is, uh, is very strong, so it's sort of get right back at you, or, or reflection. So the beam dimensions are infinitely thin in both section thickness and also lateral dimension. But this is not true because the beam does have a dimension, and that can cause um, certain uh, silo artifacts, which I'll show you in a second. So in general, the characteristics of the artifact appear and disappear depending on the view. So sometimes you can see an artifact in parasternal long axis view, but then when you move to subcostal or apical views, they will disappear. So that's one way to find out like if there's a mass truly in the left atrium, because if you see a line or like some ghost in the left atrium and the parasternal long axis, but you move to uh, apical views or four chamber view or two chamber views or subcostal view, you cannot see that anymore. So it's most likely that is an artifact because a true, and, a true structure will appear in all the different views. Um, there's also artifacts will disappear when corrective measures are taken. So you have too high gain, then you can turn down the gain. Uh, if you, you know, turn on harmonics, then you know you can uh, get rid of some of the uh, knee feel or, or rip artifacts, and so on and so forth. Um, and again, I mentioned uh, if there's a real anatomy, it will remain. And then if there's instrumental problem, for example, 
uh, there, there was a time that the crystal is like really important. If one crystal is down, then the whole line is black. So I think now with the electronic steering, this particular problem is no longer present. Uh, but you know, there are sometimes um, prop problems like if the prop is fuzzy or the crystal has been like um, uh, shaken and not aligned, then you know the, the image will be fuzzy no matter where you where you where you do the uh, imaging. So th these are some ways that you can debug your problems. Um, these are words that uh, people who are planning to take the uh, national board exam should be aware of and familiar with who they are or what they are. Uh, so we'll talk about reverberation, shadowing, mirror image, uh, propagation, speed errors, refraction, side lobes and gating lobes, uh, slice thickness, multi-path artifact, um, issues of temporal resolution, and spatial resolution as well as noise. Okay, so case study number one. So let's see if I can read this. There you go. Okay, so I'm going to let it play for a little bit. I apologize. I, you know, I use some of the really old pictures, or those of the people that um, you see is actually from 2000, year 2000. So when I first arrived at St. Mike's, even before I started being a staff, I was just flying from Boston and um, um, like just helping out back then. So, so um, let's let's uh, pick on some of my colleagues. So, uh, Ines, are you there or or, or Brad? So I'm going to pick on the fellow. Yep, I'm here. These are a little bit more challenging because you know. Um, so, um, uh, Ines, you want to just give it a try and see which view we are looking at? Sure. Uh, this is the uh, uh, super external uh, window. Um, we're looking at uh, the uh, aortic arch and the descending uh, thoracic aorta. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, and uh, we can see that there is a color Doppler turned on. And uh, uh, I guess uh, the question is, uh, you want me to comment on what artifact is involved? Or? Yeah, so what, what is the problem? So I'll just identify the structure for you because I have the cursor. So this is the um, ascending aorta. Aortic arch. I think that's uh, just the venous structure around the uh, aortic arch. Uh, that's the descending aorta. Uh, that's the uh, uh, pulmonary artery that is crossed over. Um, and the, the most interesting thing is what is this? So, where, where the arrow is. There's another flow that is right out there. Yeah, so um, we can see that the color flow is not limited to the wall of the aorta, that it's kind of almost, it appears to be bleeds, uh, bleeding out uh, to the side of the aorta. Um, and uh, the, you kind of wonder if it's uh, another structure or the same structure. And um, I wonder, Dr. Chow, if this is a, uh, uh, a, uh, a beam width artifact, potentially, where uh, uh, you, um, the assumption is that uh, uh, as uh, that all the ultrasound is coming from a central beam, but as you go deeper, uh, you the the beam kind of widens, and then you can get some uh, the appearance of an uh, of uh, echoes uh, coming from the side of your central beam, like uh, we see here. And I'm just wondering if that's the case. So good guess. Um, this over here, that white spot over there, like just um, at the end of Probably one of those beam width artifacts. Usually, it's a bright structure, and then it spreads over from the same structure. So, um, and, and then you see this in the PMAC as well when it's very strong reflector. And the PMAC usually is like circular, and then you get like little hairs like spreading on the side. Th those are beam width artifacts. But this one is actually uh, what we um, commonly call the double aorta artifact. So you can see that during Sicily, it actually bright uh, like has the color, and then during Sicily, it has the color again. So it's like you know blinking at the same time. So this is actually a uh, reflection artifact, which I'll show you in a second. Um, so um, for those people, or for all of us who read Echo all day long, um, this is actually a very common finding. Once it's pointed out for the rest of today, you're gonna start finding about 40% of all your cases actually have it. So it's one of those things you, you, you tend to ignore because you know human beings only have one descending aorta. We're not Klingons, where we have multiple hearts and multiple aorta. Uh, only this is for Star Trek fans. Klingons are warriors, so you know they, they have multiple parts. Um, so here is actually how it works. So this is the far view of the aorta, which is actually a specular surface, 
and it acts like a mirror. So a specular surface is defined as when, when the particles um, are very tight together and it acts like a mirror. So everything that comes in is a strong reflecting beam that goes back rather than getting scattered all around. So here is actually the, the equivalent of the side wall or the far wall of the descending aorta, which acts as the reflector, like a mirror. So the sun actually comes down here and reflected off the like the far wall of the descending aorta, go to a structure which is in the flow, reflect back and comes up. But you know the, the probe doesn't know that this has occurred. So assume that you know this structure or this flow is actually over here. So that's why if you do a pulse wave Doppler here and a pulse wave Doppler here, you actually will get the same signal. So next time when you do it, like when you see it, just try it and, and I can guarantee this will happen. This is a called a double aorta artifact due to a mirror reflection. Okay, so next one. So there. Yeah. Okay, your turn. So this is a bit dark, I apologize. No, we just have a black screen. Okay, let me move back and forth a bit. Oh, there you go. Now, oh, now it's showing up again. Okay, it should be moving now. Yeah. So, No, it's not going to get. I, yeah, we, I can't see anything, Dr. Chow. I'm sorry, it's coming up again. So left atrium, left ventricle. So this is actually a mechanical metro valve with some um, bubbles, uh, called capitation bubbles. And what I want to show you is more this. Can you see the color jet? It's over here. Have a left in here. Left and go over here. Oh, it's gone. I don't know why it's not showing up. Maybe I just escape out oh, maybe that would be better okay how about now can you see it yeah a little bit better it'll be better yeah sorry i'm going to stick with this mode i don't know what's ha what's happening with my system but there you go are you able to see the loop that um there's a color flow that is in the left atrium which is right over here. So again, I, I am not exactly, I can't, I can't, it's hard to tell. Sorry. Okay. So the point is, there's a huge left atrium, there's a mechanical metro valve in between, right? And then there's a left ventricle over here. And then you get this color jet that is blue, that is only occupying in like, you know, the superior portion of the left atrium and it doesn't go very far anywhere. Can you see that blue jet here? I'm just going to play it a little bit more. So I apologize, it's not projecting well because it's, it's um, I can see that it's probably hesitating on, on, your, on your screen. Okay, so I'm going to move on a bit. So this is actually, um, you're seeing the a blue jet that is actually behind the um, mitral valve. And, and it's not, you're not supposed to be able to see anything because during systole, the mechanical leaflet actually closes. So it bounces off everything that is a sound wave. So the left atrium should be dark, but yet you're actually seeing a blue jet that is um, in the left atrium.
Let me see if I can go to the next slide. Okay, how about now? Can you see it better? Well, no. Okay, so when you do a pulse wave Doppler um, onto this particular blue jet, you can see that this particular signal shows up. So I think the steel frame you should be able to see. Is that is that normal to to see that uh, that um, structure? Like the, that waveform in the in the left atrium with MR? Uh, uh, no, no, that um, you know waveform would be a far more characteristic of uh, of you know something either in the LVOT or in the, in the aorta, um, some some sort of arterial. Uh, arterial um, type of structure, you know, being almost one about one meter per second in, in peak velocity. Excellent, excellent. So, I mean, with the ML jet, it should be like, you know, parabolic, like a U-shaped, right? Because it, it begins right away and, and actually only stops when the valve closes. And also the, the, the jet velocity should be like four or five meter per second in general. But this is weird because when you pulse Doppler that particular blue jet, um, you, you actually saw that it only looks like something that would be in the LVOT. Okay, so then what you what you could do is actually you can P wave or do a pulse wave Doppler uh, of the um, LVOT, uh, which is actually over here. You can see that it's actually very similar. The velocity uh, is actually very similar. The shape is very similar. So so now it actually makes you wonder why is there a LVOT type of signal that is uh, located in the um, in the left atrium. So what we're supposed to see is actually a blue jet over here. So in fact, this is something called a multi-path artifact. So what happened is that the sound beam comes off and like, you know, basically a uh, bounce off the LVOT signal and actually get reflected in the left atrium. Sometimes it bounces off uh, through the septum as well. So it becomes a multi-path or just a reflection. And this is a paper that uh, uh, Dr. Lawrence Ruski and myself actually published uh, when, when we were during our training. Uh, so this is known as the multi-path artifact, okay? So we could, the, 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 the sound beam could actually um, reflect it off the, um, uh, of the mitral valve um, because it's tilted often towards the uh, septum and then it bounces off the um, uh, inferior septum and then goes back up. So it, it, it completes a whole loop and then you get a reflection actually on the other side of the left atrium. So back in the days, like, you know, when, when we first saw noticing it um, in the 2D echo and the color Doppler, people have like mistaken that it's a prosthetic MR because we didn't understand it very well. It ended up that we, we end up doing a number of these, um, um, uh, for these patients, we have done actually TEs and found nothing. So it actually puzzles us. So then it led to like, you know, us pulling out all the uh, pa uh, patients with the uh, mechanical mitral valve and actually start observing how often that occurs. And it's actually up to about 40% of the patients can can have this. Next time, whenever you see like, you know, a blue uh, a blue jet or, or ML jet in, in the other side of the mitral valve, think about pulse wave doppling it and, and recording it, the waveform, so you can see what it looks like. So that, that's a trick that we recommend. Okay, so next one. Should be more straightforward. Is Karen there today? Um, so sorry, today I'm intending to pick up on, on the, the echo fellows so with a bit more challenging discussion. No problem, we deserve it. <laughs> I apologize. I don't know why it's keep dropping off with um with the uh, with the screen being today. It's very weird. Okay. So with the, this is the abdominal aorta, you know, you put a prop and, and then you see a very dilated aorta. And uh, what do you see in the, in the, in the abdominal aorta? Can you see the movie pick moving? Yep, I, I, I can see, uh, still an image for me, I assume it's uh, meant to be, but you can see linear density um, kind of uh, like now, but you could see linear equidemic across the uh, abdominal aorta there. Um, so, I mean, certainly with it being dilated, you would be concerned about a dissection or a dissection flap, but given the nature of this talk, you do wonder if it's um, mirror artifacts from the, um, the anterior uh, wall there. 
um, and it's it's kind of just mirroring um, that. It's about the same distance from the probe as well, which would kind of support that. Um, but then you'd want to put color across, see if it respects color. Um, mm -hmm. You could also emote it. Um, that might be helpful too. Yeah. So I think now you can see it moving. I hope. But yeah, like this definitely, definitely on first glance is, is scary for a dissection yeah. flap for sure. That. Yeah. <laughs> You put a probe in the in the abdomen and say, "Oh my God!" Okay, so um, okay, next one. Now we put the color on. So let's play it. Maybe I have to escape out of the picture and play it this way. How about now? Can you see it? So that's true lumen and false lumen. Yeah. And that's a yeah. That's a you can see that it does respect the cult. Yeah. So again, you know, during systole. So basically, you can see. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. You, you go ahead. Thank you. Oh, I was just gonna say, it, it looks like for for most of it, it does respect um, that 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 line. The color does respect it. And then on kind of the left side of the screen, you could see what looks like maybe a kind of a connection into that. So maybe that's the entry point. Into so maybe this actually is a true uh, dissection flap, and that's the entry point. Um, so the way we usually tell a true lumen is expand during uh, systole and uh, like collapses during diastole. Uh, and then if it's the false lumen, it's the opposite and so on and so forth. So sometimes the true lumen is actually a lot smaller than the false lumen. So be that as it may, I mean, there's clearly there's dissection in the abdominal aorta, right? So that's, that is quite certain here with the imaging. So the next thing, like this is still the abdominal aorta. Let me escape out so that you can see the movie. It seems that I have to escape out of the movie before you can see it. So again, you know, that just shows you there's a true lumen and a false lumen, and often with the <clears throat> with the KRS, we can see which one is expanding, which one is collapsing. There seems to be a penetration um, that is uh, over here or entry site over here. Okay, so that that uh, that is quite certain. Now, what is uncertain is this. So, so back then, you know, this patient, um, we didn't have a um, uh, CT like that often, but even sometimes with CT, um, then you run into the challenge that the patients may have like a really bad creatinine. Then you have to start, you know, wondering about, you know, um, using TEs to rule uh, approximately the same uh, uh, involvement, right? So, Escape out so that you can uh, you can see it moving. So you can see this is the it this is a transesophageal echo. It's almost like the 110 or 120 view. Um, this is the proximal ascending order when we like pull up. You see that there's a line in the middle of this uh, aorta. So now here's a problem. So uh, you're in a CICU back then. It's called CCU. And the patients have abdominal uh, dissection for sure, and they want to see if they have, like, you know, extend backwards or originated from where. So they want to know that. So what what should you do? What what do you call this? There's a linear artifact in the middle of the aorta, or something that is ghost. So they want to see more pictures. So what will you do next? Um, yeah, I mean, more pictures is always the right answer. Yeah. I definitely, I just put color on it and exactly. see again what what color does that be the very good. So, okay, so I I actually did something else instead. Uh, let's see if I put the color on in this. No, I didn't. So what I did is I uh, the color actually uh, does not respect it, um, and it sort of goes right through it. Um, but what what I did instead is I did the um, I did this. So what is actually I start measuring things. So there is a more sort of like hollow structure around it, and there's a line above it. And when you measure that line to the proximal aorta wall and from the proximal aorta wall to this artifact, and, and you can see that the distance is about the same. It's about 216 centimeters in this case. And when you put the M mode along it, it's actually kind of interesting. You see that this linear artifact in the middle of the aorta, sort of it, it, like when there's a bump up there, and it's actually there's a bump up here, and, and, by, and, and similarly, right? So, so it actually has exactly the same configuration. So what, what do you think that is? What, what am I trying to prove here? 
I think you're thinking it's like uh, it's mirroring that, so it's the same no. distance from the probe uh, as well. So it's kind of reflecting uh, distally. Exactly. So or, mirror, or deep. Yeah, you got it. So the mirror artifact is very typical that it actually has very similar distance. Let's see if this thing moves. Okay. So just so here you can see, you know, this distance and this distance is actually exactly the same. So. Fortunately, I, I, you know, I was actually a very junior person at the time, and uh, I call, I called it, and and thank God the patient didn't have a proximal ascending uh, aortic dissection. But if I if I made a mistake, then you know, that that would be not very good when you're junior staff, and then you send someone for surgery, and then like they didn't find it, your your reputation will be will be significantly tarnished. So these these are the call that we make, and uh, so again, you know, um, the image can be a, um, because of the strong reflector, you can actually have a mirror artifact or sometimes they call reverberation exactly um, the same distance as is away. So again, you know, sometimes what happens is that you have a left atrium uh, behind and then this wall and uh, can be reflected over here that uh, caused this artifact to be in the middle of the aorta. So this is actually the left atrium, uh, one of the views where the left atrium is big and then you can see this artifact with the near wall of the left atrium being reflected into the middle of the aorta, and so on and so forth. So, again, these are these are some of the formation of the artifact. So let's keep going. I hope you can see this moving. The moving part is really important. So let's go back to um, uh, I guess an S. All right, um, so I guess we're, we're uh, this is the peristernal long axis. Yeah. And uh, the image is quite choppy and I'm kind of wondering uh, uh, what exactly am I looking at in terms of an artifact? So focus on the, um, so I apologize, this is um, the artifact. <laughs> I'm creating another artifact on top of the artifact by, you know, this is called the temporal resolution problem. So because what I'm trying to show you is quite smooth my screen but because of the like transmission of the system the frame rate drops so that's why you're missing some frames in between so what i'm trying to focus you on is actually the the posterior wall yeah i know it's very choppy i, I really apologize so uh, look it's possible that uh do you are you talking about uh the posterior wall close to the left atrium yeah. Like uh, this point. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, like we can see like almost the appearance of a like a double wall. Again, the image is not really that. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that clear. But uh, I'm wondering if that's what you're talking about. Uh, but um, if it's if it is what you're talking about, uh, then. Um, like uh, it's possibly related to like almost like a refraction kind of artifact where you would see like almost like a, a double structure there at the end. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. If I can show you this, I think you know that's actually what it is. So let me just now I realize with the yeah. technology is really hard because of the temporal resolution challenge with you me showing you this yeah. smoothly. Um, let me see if I can go to the next line, the short axis. There you go. Yeah. How about now? Are you able to see it better? Yeah, uh, I see a still image of a short axis. Yeah. Now it's moving again. Oh, there we go. You see in the diastole, the wall is completely flattened. Exactly. So in this case, you wonder about the presence of a like a hiatus hernia or something yeah. resulting in uh, like a pseudodyskinesis. That's right. So that, that, that line here is actually the diaphragm, right? So anything underneath it is hiatus hernia. I've seen patients um, who had like, you know, um, peritoneal dialysis, like, you know, like they are full already, they haven't been drained. And then you are, we're imaging them and then there'll be like something that push up diaphragm. Uh, I've seen it among pregnant women uh, who are later in the term that, you know, the diaphragm is actually pushed up because of the baby uh, inside the abdominal cavity. 
Uh, and um, so, so this is actually um, most commonly associated with high hernia. You give them uh, some um, soda, you see bubbles underneath here, uh, to the uh, uh, left lower corner. And um, this is actually a very common finding. And when you, what, 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 what you can distinguish is during systole, the wall all comes in uh, towards the centroid. But during diastole, it just gets fat in the inferior aspect. Okay, so okay, so this is actually um, the, the 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 slide that's uh, shown. Uh, often is inferior, uh, affecting the inferior wall uh, as well as the posterior wall because that's actually uh, where the heart actually sits on the diaphragm. Okay, so in terms of reverberation, uh, is defined as a, a multiple echoes that appear that appears on the display as a result of you, uh, ultrasound bouncing in between two reflectors. A good examples will be, um, you know, like, like you're having your, your haircut, which we um, cannot do easily these days, uh, but if you're sitting in the middle of your hair salon and then you have a mirror in front of you and a mirror behind you, you see like this image going back and forth, back and forth. So you have multiple number of your heads in between. And when I was a kid, I loved doing that because it's so much fun. Like this, uh, I can see like, you know, uh, infinite number of me uh, getting smaller and smaller. And this happens in ultrasound as well when we do because of the um, artifacts that is created, right? So, like, so, okay, so, okay. So, and then like we, we see this sometimes in a near field artifact uh, when like this is called the onion skin artifact. When you see that, you know, this is the left ventricle here, you can see like multiple layers because the sun keep bouncing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth here and then creating almost an onion skin, obscuring the near field in the uh, left ventricular apex. So these are called like multiple reverberations. Let me escape out and hopefully you can see the motion a little bit. And this is called a reverberation artifact. Sometimes um, it could be confused with the uh, left atrial clots or the laminar clots. And obviously one way to get rid of this problem uh, is by using um, uh, using uh, harmonics uh, as well as using contrast. Okay, so let me just go back here. Let's keep going. Okay, so the, another type of uh, artifact is called Kamatel, and it's also known as the ring down artifact. So it often appears as a solid line that directs like downwards. It's what we call merger reverberation because the reverberation occurs inside the structure itself. So the, the structure itself becomes a two mirror and then you just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then creating a like common tail that follows it. So the characteristics is, is usually single, it's a long echo, and then it's also parallel to the sound beam. Okay, so we, we do see that, um, you know, um, uh, quite common uh, with um, uh, the one that uh, I will show you the example would be the uh, tricuspid annulus. Uh, if, you, if you remember the subcostal view, when you have a tricuspid annular fat, um, in the subcostal view, the tricuspid annulus will cast one long shadow that keeps moving back and forth. Uh, as, the, as the tricuspid annulus moves, it moves back and forth and um, uh, causing this, uh, what we call the common tail or ring down artifacts. Okay, shadowing uh, is another concept. It occurs when ultrasound beam is unable to pass through a structure. Any structure that lies deeper than the initial structure are not image or displayed, and sound cannot pass through the pulmonary structure because it has a higher than usual attenuation rate or a, become a major scatterer of ultrasound. A good example here will, the, will be the left atrium distal to the mechanical mitral valve, which I've shown you early on in the picture. So this is another uh, good example. Um, this is a aorta here. This is a parasternal long axis view. That's the ventricle, that's a huge left atrium. You can see actually there's a shadow that comes in, in this view. And if there were any much left atrium.
often make apology for those older who listen to Pink Floyd. Uh, it's called the, the other side of the moon. As many of you know, um, the moon rotates in such a way that from from the uh, from the Earth, uh, you can only see part of the moon on on one side, but you can't see it on the other side. And for those sci-fi fans, um, they they make this uh, point uh, in a, um, a Transformer uh, movie that like you know they talked about you know the the Transformer actually like stays on the other side of the moon. You know that there's always in the 1960s they worry about the Russians building a whole base on the other side, and that was a rumor that's why Kennedy uh, sent off the uh, people to go on the moon to make sure there's nothing on the other side. So that that's the, you know the historical aspect of the dark side of the moon. Um, as far as a mirror image is concerned, um, the sun bounces off a strong uh, reflector uh, called a specular reflector in the path, and the ultrasound system assumes the sun travels directly to a reflector and back to the transducer. And the characteristics is ends up having a second copy of a true anatomy. A copy is located deeper than the true anatomy, and the mirror lies in a straight line between the transducer and the artifact, and the distance between the true anatomy and the mirror to be equal to the distance between the artifact and the mirror. So we, we have shown a number of these examples uh, already. And these are some of the animation that I made that shows that concept. And um, this is a concept that we all see. Uh, See if I can escape out so you can see it. So you can see the um, motion of the mitral valve on the other side. It's almost like you have a heart that is exactly on the other side. It's, it's a mirror image on the other side that's uh, open and closed. We, in our mind, we often just filter it out because we know there shouldn't be anything on the other side. So our brain just say, "Wow, that's nothing." So, but in fact. You can see everything actually all mirrors um, uh, almost correctly. Uh, the septum here, that's the septum down here. You get a much above opening and closing. You get a much above opening and closing right here. Okay, so that's a one type of mirror art image we commonly see every single day. And the other common, uh, the other example is the double aorta artifact, which I've shown early on. So you see the flow that is like systole and cyst, and this is because of the mirror on the far wall of the aorta. In fact, you can observe the far wall of the aorta if the if the angle to the transducer, like you know, the incident beam angle is less than 45, somewhere between 30 to about 60, it actually reflects perfectly. But if you have a wall of the distal wall of the aorta, which is fairly straight, which is more than like, you know, um, um, almost parallel to the beam, then you won't actually have it. Next time when you do supergenome, you'll know, pay attention to this and, and you'll find it actually fascinating. Okay, so the propagation speed error occurs in the, in the time that um, when we do the calibration, because the phantom actually needs to put in the right mix of alcohol and water. Um, to be able to like you know get the right speed um, with the ultrasound, I, I don't think we have this problem anymore because we don't really actually use Phantom to calibrate things, but we can use still use the Phantom uh, to do uh, experiments uh, like you know all these artifact experiments. Uh, but remember, the speed of the ultrasound in the machine is assumed to be one five four zero, so that we can actually know exactly where the distance is. So similar to you know the um, the way the submarine uh, in, in the Navy, trying to figure out where things are in the front of you, and same as bats, and same as uh, dolphins, trying to, uh, what they call echolocation, to see how far your, your object is, so the bats can fly in, in complete darkness and still, you know, uh, get the prey, so as to say. 
Okay, so refraction is something that actually uh, is a physical phenomenon. Uh, it doesn't actually occur that often, but uh, what happens is when you go for a media of different density, I'm, I'm sure you learned that in, um, in, in, um, in physics when you were earlier in your career, like you stick a pan into the water, the pan is supposed to be straight, but then you can actually see the, see the pan actually is crooked, and that, that's because of refraction. And sometimes uh, we can see that because the, the anatomy location is actually misregistered in a different location because um, you, you travel between two different media um, inside your structure. Um, this is another slide. This is a steel frame, and this is the PMAC I was telling you about. And um, this is a commonly known as the beam width artifact. You can see the PMAC is supposed to be here, but then you can see a little hair on the other side because the beam is supposed to be like infinitely narrow, but there is actually width or what we call silo. So, so that you, you got both something that is like you measure bigger, and also you get bright reflectors on the side because of these presence of silos. And, and you know, it, it becomes a bit of a problem because when, when, the, when the heart moves, the, the mag moves up and down with the analyst, um, these artifacts uh, move with it because of the silo, right? And, um, and there's also something, um, and the silo occurs because of the following reasons. So when you have a beam, um, like when, when you think about this, when you start echo, the, the probe itself is actually like a like a flat structure, like you know, like this thick. But then you actually see the beam actually comes back and forth like a uh, like a fan, right? So the way it happens is because the the probe actually has a whole bunch of crystals and sends off you know um, beam by delay, so it it can steer the beam to the side and then like very quickly move back and forth. Um, when we started echo, like you know, in the in the 70s with 2D, there's actually a mechanical device that turned the beam one way and the other. But as, as the time moves on, now they put in you know 16 crystals, and then later on 64, and now 50, 258, and now you can do a 3D matrix on it, and it actually steers the beam in such a way that it can go back and forth electronically, so it can go back and forth really really quickly. But the fact that you're steering the beam create these constructive interference at times but obviously the strongest signal will be in the middle of the axis of the beam and then and, and every now and then you know depends on how far you are in the angle you get constructive interference and then you get destructive interference in between and then you get constructive interference so when 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 you actually put it onto the acoustic mapping uh, sometimes what they do to this kind of experiment, they put the probe in the water tank, and then you can go along, like, along the axis, um, and then trying to map the signal. You find that, like, if the if the um, signal um, is measured along the beam axis, is the strongest, and then every now and then when you go like further away by measuring of the angle, it actually has a small peak. And then so on and so forth until it completely attenuates to 180 degrees. So, so this is actually like you know whenever you show a picture like this as a echo uh, echo person or or ultrasound person with a sector um, probe, um, this is actually what the beam actually looks like. So here if you have the PMAC here, but because of the constructive interference and the is um, and subsequently you know in uh, the silos. You actually get brighter signals on the side, so that's that's why you can explain some of these things. And as you move along in the main axis here, and then you get these silos because of the um, the beam itself has has a pattern to it, rather than completely flat. And one of the ways to get rid of it is using something called second harmonics. And here's what happened when you have the main beam, when you give use something called the harmonic imaging. The second harmonic is going to be um, a lot lower in terms of um, uh, the reflection uh, by looking at the second harmonic. So you send off uh, the signal in the main frequency and you listen in the two times of that main frequency, uh, otherwise known as an octave. Then what you do is take that reflection of the second harmonics and amplify it back again um, using like electronic method. Then, because the reflection, 
is, is lower in intensity and doesn't have that much signal from the silo, then when you amplify it, you actually get rid of the silo. Okay, so that's why you can reduce these silo artifacts by using harmonics. I think it's um, enough time, we're five minutes away. I'm, I'm just going to see if there's any questions because there's going to be a bit more to this, but uh, I think that's probably more than enough today. Um, and uh, what, any questions from the audience? I hope you're still there, <laughs> all of you. It's easier in the room as I Yeah, no, that was great. Thanks a lot, Dr. Chow. Yeah. No, it's very clear, Chi Ming. Fantastic explanations. Okay, thank you. I'm going to keep it uh, simple. I think it's one minute and 30 seconds away from nine o'clock. So just remember to do your evaluation. I apologize. Some of these uh, uh, temporal artifact that is caused by, by the, um, uh, by the, it was a very good demonstration of a temporal artifact because when you're trying to show something smooth, but your sampling time is actually lower. This happens in color Doppler. When you do 2D, it's about you know 60 to 100 frames per second or hertz. And then when, when you actually put color on, it actually drops significantly to around 15 to, to 30 because you have so much information to process. So sometimes you see the color actually doesn't map on the 2D. But I'm gonna stop here. And uh, thank you so much everyone for your, for your attention. And uh, I hope someday we'll be back in one room. It will be a lot easier to, to actually talk about this. Okay, thank you. Have a good day. Thanks to me.